in India, the Hindu philosophy, Hindu mythology in particular, is considered history, not mythology. I went to Ceylon and asked, you have in your history a king called Raman? And they said, no, we haven't heard of him. So there was no Ramana in Shilod. But Ramayana says there was Ramana. And Rama waged a war against Ravan. <coughs> but if there was none there, in fact, mythology was a style of literature of conjuring up events that are imagined, not real. So they are not historical. But it was granted that even these imagined facts or events would lead to lessons that are morally survivable. survivable. Now, that, from that point of view, if you look at Ramayana, it gives you several moral lessons. Likewise, Mahabharata. Mahabharata is also a myth, a mythology, but is considered absolutely history. Now, this, so mythology from one culture to another, from one religion to another, is divisible, divides people. Another thing that divides is icon worship, the worship of uh, the icon. What do you call it? Puppets. Idols. Images. Simple yeah. images. No, uh, every image is different from another. Particularly, when an image has been made by man, <coughs> man makes the image. How can you worship? Abraham, a, a prophet, early, earlier than uh, Jesus Christ, his, his father had made he was an artist, his father, a sculptor, and had made several images, images of God. And had gone out and told uh, Abraham to look after these images, because these images are gods. And they're very powerful things. People worship them. Abraham became a little skeptic in his mind. So he went and tinkered with one of the images and wanted to see what this image could do? The image couldn't do anything, so he broke it. Said he may not be the only one that was so weak, let me try others. And he tried on others, and he broke all. When his father came, he was very curious. He said, what have you done? He says, I was only testing. You said these were very powerful. None of them appeared to you to be really powerful. So I have broken all of them. <coughs> but image worship did not stop <coughs> even after that. It continues. <coughs> you have images in Christian churches. You have images in Hindu churches. Images in Buddhist churches still continue in their division. The Christian images you cannot you, you cannot worship if you are worshipping Hindu. And lastly, there is the bias of language. Every scripture is in a language, and that language has come to be considered holy, sacrosanct. And therefore, because one scripture is in one language, another scripture in a very different language, the two are divisive. Now, this kind of, uh, these divisive trends that has been discovered are, uh, in addition to these, there were other situations which caused disbelief among people. One of them, for instance, miracles. Christian uh, Christians believe in miracles. And there are books written on justification of miracles and so on. But unfortunately for them, Science has produced miracles and is producing miracles day after day which are far more important and effective than the miracles that the prophets had produced. So that came to produce disbelief among those 
who thought the prophets are uh, testable by the miracles that they can wield. Similarly, cosmology, how the world came to be, how the universe came to be. Every religion has its own dicta, which one different from another. And perhaps everyone's uh, the thought is invalid according to the modern researches of science. And then there was lack of universal values. If you look at the values produced or uh, pampered by one religion and another religion, you will find there are a few which are common, but there are very many which are uncommon or not uh, uh, replaceable. Then the scriptures, most of the scriptures have not been produced or written as a first-hand version. Many people after the prophet or after the avatar have written those lines. So their verifiability and their reliability is doubtful. That is how during the last century an important uh, German philosopher Nietzsche declared God is dead. Now that is the situation, that is great dismay of mankind. Then Certain alternatives for religion were produced. Humanism, rationalism, communism. But they were all emotionally cold and spiritually sterile. So none of them has really taken the place of religion. And that is another dismay. Now this mass dismay about which we have so far talked, what has it done? What have been its results? <coughs> One result was that it generated a new quest, a religious spiritual quest. Everyone, when in dismay, wants a spiritual, spiritual hold, a spiritual security. So, a quest again arose. And now, in this country, even you would find there are thousands of people who are going to the so called gurus. Thousands of them. That, that is happening not only here, everywhere in our country, in India also. But there arose disbelief in gurus as soon as it was discovered that they were not gurus but pseudo gurus. <coughs> they were false gurus. And that is because there are far many more false gurus than real gurus. In fact, if you remember, when uh, Guru Mahakishan declared that Baba was in Bakala and Guru Teg Bahadur was the only one there to whom he was referring, there were 22 Sodhis that had come to claim that we are the real Guru. To, to me, everyone said, to me had Guru Mahakishan pointed. So they were all pseudo Gurus. <coughs> so the pseudo Gurus are far more to man. Guru Teg Bahadur was, in a, in a, was even forgotten where he was. Somebody discovered him. Now then, uh, that was one repercussion that uh, individuals wanted to seek spiritual guidance and advice from wherever. The second thing that happened was that many people have thought this, that now is the time when some new religion should emerge, a religion which can really look at this whole system the failure of this whole uh, set of systems and produce a global system and everyone should really be with it. That didn't look emerging because for that you need first of all a very towering spiritual personality who is not only himself uh, salvage <coughs> but is also capable of salvaging others. Unless that happens, this doesn't take place. The other alternative was to look at, to find out if there was a, an existing religion which can fulfill this function. Now then, this function of becoming the world religion, then it was thought, yes, there is one. And that is the case. Now, there is a talked about a great philosopher already, Bertrand Russell. He made a statement. He said, 
if some, you can read it, if some lucky men survive the onslaught of the Third World War of atomic and hydrogen bombs, then the Sikh religion will be the only means of guiding them. Then he was asked, but isn't this religion capable of guiding mankind before the Third World War? Russell replied, yes, it has this capability, but the Sikhs have not brought out in the broad daylight the splendid doctrines of this religion which has come into existence for the benefit of the entire mankind. This is their great sin and the Sikhs cannot be freed of it. Now when I read this statement of Bertrand Russell, I thought, what is it? What has impressed, what, what might have impressed him? I don't know really, but I have begun to think why he would make this statement. He was born Christian and he gave up Christianity. And he has written so much against Christianity, you can't even imagine. But how was he impressed about Sikhism? Now, I have a feeling that, the, that Sikhism has certain aspects which can impress anyone. First of all, no exclusivism. Sikhism does not believe that we have the whole truth and no one else has. In fact, Guru Nanak says, Suraj Eko Ruttane Nanak Karte Ke Kete Pes. The various seasons originate from one sun, just as the various seasons originate from one sun. So, in the same way, there are many revelations of the original form of the creed. Then, God in Sikhism is universal. In Jewish, there is a tribal God, God of Israel. In Christianity, Jesus is son of God and even <coughs> man of God and sometimes even God himself. In Islam, Muhammad is the only prophet, the last prophet, no, he doesn't decry the earlier Semitic prophet. Muhammad is the last prophet, there cannot be a prophet after him. Again, in, um, and many other religions. They think, for instance, Buddhism says the truth is with us. The only place where you find is an open place, and that is Vedas. See, let ideas come from whatever side they put. Look at them. Chill them. them. Sorry, my just them. Sorry. Sorry, quick question. So, when Buddhism says the truth is with us or within us, is that being exclusive? Well, pardon. Uh, well, the Buddha says yes. that the truth, the seven truths that he has promulgated, that they are exclusive. Now then, universal, the Sikh God is universal. There is no such thing as Sikh God, really. Ik or God is the one. Ik is very important. Ik means universal for everyone. And the Guru says, Ik or Ik Ravya Sab Antar. Sabna ji ka adhari. Now, again he says, Sai mera eko hai, eko ha bhai eko hai. This one does not mean a numeral. It means several other things. But apart from that, he is universal. It also means he is unitive. It also means he is uh, simple. He is Undivide, undivis, indivisible. So this one little numeral that the Guru has placed is a wealth of ideas about the universal deity that he is talking about. Likewise, your cosmology is not unscientific. I would not say not, I'm not against scientific cosmology. Our cosmology says, Api ne ap sajyo, api ne rachyo nao, dhuri kutak sajyo, kar asan nitro chao, data karta aap tu, 